Something with the internet? Yeah. Let me see. Oh, I don't know. Um, just try again. My name is Margaret Wong, and to celebrate our Chinese New Year this year, in this pandemic, we are very, very lucky and fortunate to have one of our church members and world-renowned Chinese history expert on antiques, Mr. Joseph Deggenfelder. I've known him and his wife, Pauline, and his whole family, his two sons, for more than 30 years. Um, he moved to Shaker Heights, Ohio, next to Cleveland, um, and we belong to the same church. So through the years, we became friends. I was in his house looking at the antiques, and he had some really amazing, beautiful pieces. So here's Mr. Joseph Dagenfeller. Well, thank you, Margaret. Um, we did meet at church, and I have been married to my dear wife, Pauline, for 60 years. And this uh, robe is her gift to me, uh, which which I will just show and then take off so I don't get snagged in the in the art. Okay. So the uh, a key time that we met Margaret in a different way was at the uh, first lecture in uh, the Pauline Dagenfelder Endowed series of Chinese lectures at the Cleveland Museum of Art, when Margaret sat next to me in the front row as Maxwell Mike Hearn, who is head of the Asian Art Department uh, at the Metropolitan Museum, gave his talk on interpreting Chinese paintings. And yesterday, Pauline, now at Judson Park in Cleveland, represented that talk to her fellow uh, residents there. And Maxwell Hearn called in, okay, uh, briefly. And, and the record of that uh, exchange is in your email inbox, Margaret. So uh, our theme, our main theme today is Wan Yin's, okay? And I found out that Cecilia, who is uh, the main cultural contact with me, uh, carries a, uh, a reminder of Guan Yin's in her wallet. And so the, the first item we have today is Becoming Guan Yin, which is a book recently published by the Columbia University and which we will be getting a copy. But essentially it tells the story that Guan Yin's were originally up through the Song Dynasty, which is about 1000 AD, uh, male, okay? Then they started the transition to female, which is more or less complete by about the end of the Ming Dynasty in 1644. And then they became more of a patron of women's spirits, okay? particularly as I remarked the other day in a, in a male dominated world, which I think the Chinese society is. So it turns out we had had some earlier Guan Yin's and then under the rule of 10, I uh, had purchased six more, okay? Which you see arrayed before us, okay? So I'm gonna work up to the, the smaller ones first. These in the front uh, are made of ceramic painted ivory, ceramic, uh, this is carved agate, this is brass. And for instance, this to me is the most male looking. This is also male looking, but this one is definitely female looking. And so this, these are ones I acquired recently to, to, uh, to uh, expand out to 10, okay? Now, the one that we started with and that was on display in this room for not quite a month yet, is this carved ivory Guan Yin, which we acquired from an estate in New Jersey. And uh, it was originally described as being maybe the mid 19th century, but I've since discovered, I believe it's about a century older. The, the base, the wooden base is new, I think early 20th century, based on the adhesives we found there. 
But if you look at this carving, by the time this was carved, the, the Chinese had already been carving for five millennia. And so if you look at this robe that comes down here, and this robe that comes down here as an example, and this, these were put in to show, to disguise that this was originally an elephant's trunk, okay? So they did things to show that they were better than the last generation. <laughs> and, and so, and, and then it's finely carved. And also the reason I think it's older is that the ivory is brittle. Some of this is broken off. So this is a new base. And in fact, there were some, some points at the bottom where, where somebody had tried to renovate this in an earlier generation. So this is the gracious Guan Yin, okay? Um, this particular Guan Yin, which has been in our dining room exhibit of Margaret has seen, is a, uh, not a copy, but it is an, a, a quote improvement over one in the Shanghai Museum that is, this particular one is exactly 50% larger, exactly. But the one in the Shanghai Museum has no hands, it just has a folded a front where it's much easier to produce. It has a very simple base, okay? So when somebody was going to emulate, this is called Blanc Chin, which is white china. They did a much more intricate hands, which were carved separately. And then this base is unusually delicate, <laughs> you know, instead of just being a plain base. So this is one that we keep there also to protect it by some miracle that the fingers have not been broken off. This was also exhibited at the Cleveland State Museum exhibit that we had in 2016, made it there and back. Now, the, the most significant, particularly, we can now refer to these books, which uh, we got. This, this one over there is one we read last year on the demise of the East India Company and the period before the Opium Wars in China. It, it, and it, it's a very detailed book. This book by Spence is even more detailed. And uh, we have a copy coming for Margaret and, and uh, Cecilia. And is a, is a superb edition, okay? And it describes life in Canton in the early 19th century. Now, just for a little briefing, in our early 19th century, the United States of America was not established as a secure, com as a secure company com country until the War of 1812, which is called the Second War of Independence, okay, when uh, uh, President Andrew Jackson defeated the British in the Battle of New Orleans, actually after the war ended, but it gave us great bargaining power. So um, this one dates exactly to 1911. So one of the great themes from the time of our civil war to the end of the century in China was the Taiping Revolution. And this book describes how a person named Hong Huizam, which I can't quite pronounce, decided that he had gone to heaven conversed with God, was the younger brother of Jesus Christ, and came to China to rescue his fellow citizens from the corrupt rule of the Qing dynasty, which were the barbarians from the north. When the, when the Ming fell, it was the king who came in and took over, and they weren't Chinese. So the, the Chinese expanded to their greatest expanse under the king by someone who was not, but after, by the time of that mid 19th century, his, they were increasingly isolated in their, in their palaces and they had difficulty ruling the rest of the country. So this is, and in this, the, the minimum estimates is that about 20 million Chinese were, were killed, more or less at the same time as our American Civil War. At the end, Empress Sixi was ruled through the end and she died in 1911, okay? And there was something that we know as the Boxer Rebellion in 1896, but in China, it was known as the Society of the Righteous Fist. 
in which they were reacting against Western influence, establishing China supremacy, and several rich Chinese Catholics were murdered for and their families for embracing Roman Catholicism. So at the end of that period, this particular top is pink quartz. Some of you know rose quartz, which is, which is actually deeper red. But pink quartz only comes from Brazil. And the largest other specimen I've ever seen is about three inches tall. Because if you look at it, it crazes and breaks. So I believe that this is the largest pink quartz in existence that was brought in by an Indian merchant to China. And the base is Carrera marble, which is, which is uh, mined, quarried from northwest of Rome. So this was put together to show, and, and this, this particular aspect of a Guanyin is becoming, looking more like Mary, the mother of, our mother of God. It, it's, it's, if you notice, it's, it's, less, it's less Chinese, so it's, it itself is a transition. So this was purchased by the family to celebrate their celebration, their rescue under the new government, and then Two or three, gen three generations later, some younger people said, what are we doing with this? It was put up for sale in Hong Kong and purchased by Tse Tung, who was the father of the dealer Peter Tung that I received this from in New York City at the Manhattan Art and Antique Center. So we, uh, one of our goals is to put these pieces in their best place. So we haven't found a home for this yet. Uh, and, well, and nor these. Now, there are a few pieces out front that I just brought in impromptu. Uh, and the piece on the left is a piece of, uh, it's not as old as it was supposed to be, but it shows that over the years, iron oxide ions will infiltrate into jade and change the color, okay? And the reason the one on the right is that this is a dragon and there are probably 10,000 of these dragons. The, the dimples are signify heaven, but this is certified by Gu Fang, the, the leading uh, Chinese art expert currently in New York City because of COVID. Uh, that from the Warren States period, about 250 BC. But then it was brought to the Qing Dynasty and gold applied to both sides, okay? Front and back. And so this is real gold. So, uh, so we, we have another piece of, of jade from the Western Zhao, about 1200 BC, which is white with these ions infiltrated that looks like gold. So this is our future pair that we may attempt to donate to the Metropolitan Museum. So thank you for letting me come, Margaret. Oh, thank you, thank you. So can you explain to me what made you interested? Because I also talked to your son and your son lived in China actually for five years. Well, so as I told you before, my, my first introduction to China was back in the late 1940s when I I was born in 39 and went to a, a Catholic school where the priest gave out silver dollars for academic excellence. And my first contact with China was taking some of my sil silver dollars and contributing them to for the starving people in China. I mean, I have to say the next one is when our elder son, Eric, who is like me, a, a chemical engineer in, uh, from Cornell University, uh, moved from another company, DuPont, and then was moved to Shanghai to run DuPont's uh, coatings operations, performance coatings in Asia and some other places around the world. And Pauline and I made three trips to them in October of, uh, uh, to, uh, December of 20, 2008, October of 2010, when we went down through the Three Gorges Dam 10 days before it was declared complete. And in October 2011, we visited Hong Kong these times, Beijing, etc., and we saw a lot of Chinese art. 
and I found out I could not afford Chinese art in China. It was much cheaper, cheaper at the Manhattan Art and Antique Center in Manhattan. So that's how we started. And, um, but also, the, uh, it, it's, a, it's a great story. I never had the time to take an art course in Cornell or any place. But also, the, one of the most important things in, the 20th, in this century is the relations between the United States and China. And I'm going to try to work on that a little bit. That's awesome. So what gives you the energy? Because I've been working with you in the past few days to come to this point. Oh my gosh, you're so energetic. I look at you and I'm like, how does he do that? What time do you go to bed? What time do you get in the Well, day? okay. I, and I, I guess I've thought about that. It turns out that in World War II, there was a shortage of men, to say the least. And so my father worked at Curtis Wright Aircraft in Buffalo. Uh, I had several uncles away in the war. He made the P-40, which was used in China by the, uh, 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 by the forces there to, actually the, the, the World War II started in China in 1937 when the Japanese came in and took over parts of, of China. So, uh, so at the age of four and the age of six, <laughs> My older brother, we started to run the farm. So we got up and did chores, and then we went to school, and then we came back and did more chores, and we ate dinner, and then we did more chores. So the only thing I know is working. I don't, I don't know what this relaxing is. So besides, there are some things I would like to get done before I'm dead, and, and I'm starting to realize that I will die, so I better, I better get to it. Awesome. And can you tell us a little bit about Pauline, your beautiful wife? Pardon me? Can you tell us a little bit about Pauline? Oh, yes. well, okay, we were, um, first of all, Pauline's mother, uh, Elsie Zenix, was a dress designer in New York City. And so Pauline was a year after me, so she sends her daughter off to Cornell. Pauline was the honor graduate at the Mary Lewis Academy in Jamaica Estates. And the nuns there would not give her a recommendation to go to Cornell because Cornell was a heathen place, okay? So she got a recommendation from her Jewish dentist, then visited, and that's how she got to Cornell. So I first met her at a Newman Club meeting of Catholic students where her mother had dressed her in a gown that showed off female attributes, let's just say. That's how we met. So then she later became uh, active at uh, Chi Omega Sorority, ended up being president. And so I would go over there and that helped civilize me a little bit, okay. And, uh, and then uh, later on when we both, of course, graduated, each of our sons went to Cornell because we started taking them there when they were in their diapers, okay. So we've been married for 60 years now and uh, and we do things as a family, okay, as you see from our Christmas newsletter. So that's why Pauline is with me today. That's awesome. And your son also works as, where does your son work? Oh, uh, our son Eric, who you uh -huh. met. Uh, by the way, I was here the other day and, and, and Eric and, and, and Margaret spoke for an hour. Uh -huh. Cecilia and I were bystanders. Our son Eric was the uh, honor graduate of the Cornell class, chemical engineering class of 1986. In 1993, he was the honor graduate of the Kellogg MBA school. And so he could fix things. I think he got some of his background from his father who did a lot of things in industry. So um, when he went to uh, to, uh, to DuPont Performance Coatings, he improved some things. And then later, the Carlisle Group, which had 189 billion under management, did a leverage buyout of DuPont Performance Coatings, in which Eric was the vice president of transition. And then in 2014, they changed the name to Exalta Coating Systems. It was listed on the New York Stock Exchange, where he was prominent. And he now currently is running a coatings company based in Buffalo, New York, which is about 40 miles from my home farm in Western New York. And he's uh, and has some operations in Seattle, but he comes and visits me every 
every three weeks or so from Buffalo. Good. And and he's he's my best reference. Oh, and your other son? Oh, Curtis. Uh, you can find Curtis at DagenfelderHealth.com. Uh, Curtis is has been in New York. Um, worked uh, under his mother at one point. Uh, Pauline was. Uh, a senior VP for Cigna in Hartford on the fourth floor, and Curtis worked on the first floor. He uh, split off and formed his own company, but he is the U.S. leader in federally qualified community health centers. This is where large hospitals don't know how to handle their care for the indigent, and if they spin off into a separate center, they can get a very good flow of federal crack, uh, federal cash to do this, which is continuing, and he has clients in all 50 states, okay? He's been somewhat curtailed uh, now, but you can see Curtis at Dagenfelder Health. Uh, and he was, he is, uh, uh, between, Eric was always the, the, the good altar boy and very straight, Curtis was somewhat the little devil, uh -huh. but I'll just throw that in. But. And all the years I've known you, followed your career, heard about you, can you give us five ways, or our listeners five ways to how to be as successful as you are? Well, first of all, uh, I've done a couple startups, but I've done more turnarounds, okay? And when you go to a turnaround, whatever you're told is the system there is not actually the system. So the first thing you have to do is to find out the real system and then change it. And my first rule is you have 30 days. You either get their attention in the first 30 days. And uh, I did have a little military background. I was on the advance party for the invasion of Cuba, in the 1962 Russian Missile Crisis as a second lieutenant where I had to overrule people of, of colonel rank or higher. It's a good thing that was canceled by President Kennedy. He may have saved my life. Uh, so you have to find out the real system and then you have to, you have to make multiple changes uh, concurrently. And the other rule is you have to teach the people you find. You have to use mostly what you find. And so I think I'm pretty good at that. And um, so, uh, so, so there's finding out the system, training the people you find. Uh, the other aspect there is that, um, oh, and reusing capital equipment. For instance, uh, I ran uh, Borden Kemmel's Lemister Works in 1974 to 77 when the first standards for an industrial carcinogen, vinyl chloride, were established by OSHA and EPA. And uh, when we were had to get the the ambient exposure down to one part per million, we first measured it as 176 parts per million. So we had to change everything. Okay. So there's a there was a re, it, it's good to have a reason to push. Okay. So and we we did that by by rebuilding those processes. And of course. Eric and Curtis were with me and they kind of saw me do that, okay? So, uh, so I would say uh, you can perform better when there is a national crisis, or the, a crisis in that case, and now there is a national crisis in this country where one of the reasons why I would like to do something in presenting Chinese art is to have some degree of cohesion of bringing together in this country, which is terribly divided, as we can read in the Wall Street Journal every day. So there seems to be five principles in there somewhere. <laughs> That's right, yes. And if you have to recommend two books or three books that you recommend to our listeners to read, what are the names of those books? Well, uh, it, it turns out <laughs> this book, which I'm not all the way through, I had read a previous book on the Taiping Revolution, but this uh, Spence is a superb writer and his descriptions in the first two chapters or three of what he finds in Canton are, are it, it's like being there. It's like being there. So very powerful writer and he actually brings those in from other sources. So I would, I would say that. Um, 
other books. Uh, I have a lot of books on World War II. Um, uh, oh, and the, uh, so uh, actually, Margaret, I'm at the point now that I don't have time to read books. So uh, uh, I'll have to think about that. And may I tell our listeners how old? Do you mind if I tell them how old you are? But you're eight well, old. okay, That's you're you're birthday. you're going to embarrass me because um, I I won't be 82 until another month, ah. less than a month. So I, but under the Chinese system, when you're born, you're considered to be a year old. That's right. So under the Chinese system, I'm 82. Awesome. Okay. Yes. But to the to these Orientals, I'm 81.9. I just want you all to know, through the years I've known uh, Dr. Delvin Butler and his her family, they're generous, they're kind, they're humble. You would never thought that there are quiet people like them who are successful, who's wealthy, and they just they give to our church, they give to our friends. Anytime we have something that we need, you know, he's right there. He comes to our office. I said, we need help. You know, it's Happy New Year. So we need, and he said, no problem. And he doesn't want us to carry this stuff, but he wants to carry it himself. And I watched him. I said, oh, my gosh. You know, if only we can all work half as hard as he does. Yes, and he's right. He's very busy. He couldn't find this person unless you call him at all hours of the day. And he does return your calls. Again, if I could, let me mention what I'm yes. very busy on. I'm the CEO of Atlanta Greenfields LLC, which uh, does technology to reduce global warming. And uh, I could uh, I could tell you every biofuels project in the United States and Canada and what has failed. And I'm currently negotiating with a uh, $13.5 billion a year company uh, that distributes fuels that has never done anything in biofuels and to put in uh, plants, the small project is to put in plants that makes uh, cellulosic ethanol to blend with gasoline. And the large project is the Fischer Trove process invented in 1928 in Germany and used in World War II by the Germans to make their distillate fuels, used heavily in South Africa and in Qatar and, and, and uh, uh, by a shell project. And so we have a project at Port Westward, Ohio, which is unique in that they have a large uh, uh, dock there that's underutilized, built to export munitions to the Pacific during World War II. And, and this company has uh, 80 acres of lease there. And there is some other land that the port bought in 2012 that will take uh, until early 2023 to get access to the port under continuous lawsuits by entities in Oregon, which is the most environmentally restrictive state in the union by far. Awesome, awesome story of a family and also an American family who's totally mind boggling Again, thanks for listening to us. And any well, questions listen, you have? I, I, I like to break the rules a little oh, bit. Okay. I'm just, oh, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening.